Ah, welcome, welcome to the pilot episode of what we are tentatively calling Game Chronicles. I'm Stephen Ansens and this is my very good and somewhat old friend Unicam. Hello everybody. Each of us has roughly 30-ish sort of years um, in terms of having playing games for that long and also each of us has roughly 20-ish sort of years of us reporting on, talking about, uh, generally investigating, being involved in the gaming industry, two different sort of uh, amounts. Uh, most of you might know I've been doing this, uh, I've been doing my Stephen Assens channel for a long, long time. Unicom's had a gaming channel for much longer than mine, but he hasn't been super active on his for several years by this point. So that's why we're doing this sort of podcast on my channel. And what we're going to do, hopefully on a more consistent basis, is we're going to try to tackle some of the more nuanced discussions related to gaming games and get the gaming industry overall. This isn't going to be uh, necessarily a news sort of podcast, uh, nor is it going to be hopefully just like a general sort of discussion podcast. For each episode, we'll have a very particular subject matter we'll discuss. And for our pilot, we thought we would start with something that is super near and dear to our hearts, and that is RPGs. CRPGs in, uh, in particular, and as a sort of uh, hallmark, trademark of this uh, podcast, drilling deeper into that, we will discuss RPG worlds. And going further than that, we're going to discuss established RPG worlds, uh, worlds versus original RPG worlds. Now, this is something I uh, sort of touched upon uh, a couple of months ago. I made a video with uh, like a fairly long list of original RPG world and that's kind of what, what what caused me to think about this sort of subject because there's always a lot of sort of discussion you know come whenever RPGs and we'll focus on RPGs not just not video games in general whenever RPGs are discussed there's always a there's always talk about whether or not something is based on something else and once something is based on something else there, uh, there, there come the inevitable discussion about, you know, is this canon? Is this not canon? Is this like in the book or movie or... Is this just ripping off Warhammer, Warhammer? Pretty much, or Dune in that case. And that's why it, it, we, we also need to set some uh, like, ground va- uh, like ground values uh, that we'll talk, like the, our own pillars of design. An established world uh, basically refers to any sort of world that already exists in a different medium. So it can be a comic book, books, uh, movies, of course, and much more pointing to this one would be tabletop games because D&D is the general culprit here. And when we talk about original stuff, again, is games that games as worlds who are that, that aren't based on any pre-existing material. This is just stuff that the developers designers came up with and they they could later on they became established world but fallout was made up uh, more or less on the spot let's say the elder scrolls again it was also initially it was uh, they started building it up as they went on and probably one of my favorite examples ever is warcraft's entire lore was made up by bell roper in the recording booth all of it Diablo also falls into also falls into that uh, into that part. Medicine just started writing the manual and it's stuck. And somebody else made the, the trailers, the uh, cinematics. No, they had no idea what the game was about. They just made some cinematics and bam, there's your story. Another example of a really interesting um, original world that is very near and dear to my heart would be that from Tyranny, of course. Or how do you see this sort of uh, discussion between? Uh, an established RPG world and an original one. Where do you see the pros and cons of each uh, being and kind of like what what are your general preferences? Well, it actually depends on what is being adapted versus what could be made if that was an original world. For example, Dungeons and Dragons. I don't care about Faerun. 
It's Faerun's a generic fantasy setting that honestly I don't think most people playing video games care about. What they do care about is the system itself, the D20 system. And you can staple that to anything else. You can staple that to Star Wars and you get Knights of the Old Republic. That's a fair point. But you can also staple it to original stuff, to new things, things that haven't been made before. And that can lead to some interesting situation, but it's still an adaptation, if you will, of, of the rules of a, a Dungeons and Dragons world. So in, in that way, it's a, it's a double adaptation in some ways. Um, I'm not really against the idea of adapting of different worlds into RPGs, or using those worlds for RPG settings, as long as it's done in a way that lets me, you know, actually explore something in that world or interact with it in new ways, or at least, like, feel like I'm there. That's something very valuable that uh, some adaptations kind of gloss over. Um, not this isn't a, an rpg but um there was a recent dune game that came out uh to, uh the, what, the spice wars yeah 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 i know you played it that's set in the dune universe but it it glosses over the dune universe like it barely touches it like you don't feel like it's dune it's there's spice in it and in most missions it's replaced with concrete and there's no difference in the game like none like that's as adaptations go that's not a great one as a setting but uh, if you're not familiar with the source material you wouldn't care and you'd you'd be right not care because that's something that doesn't really do much for the context of the game because it's a grand strategy it's not an rpg where you become Lisa al gaib it's a it's a strategy game uh, javier bardem's like going to run around selling Lisan, uh, yelling Lisa al gaib every time you do something don't give they up. should do Don't, that in the. They should do that in the, in the MMO. <laughs> yeah, they they specifically said they wouldn't. Oh, okay. Mm, but which expansions means... are. It's a live service game. The expansions are a thing. There will be a Lisan Al Gaib expansion at some point. I, I believe. That's exactly that. what I, what I was gonna say. That just means there's gonna be DLC or expansions later on. Yeah, the Javier Javier Bardem expansion. <laughs> Everyone, everyone, like all the skins, everyone, all the models just turn into him. Well, actually, there would be a precedent uh, for releasing a DLC for that game. This just have this, it's just Stilgar running behind you, yelling Lisan al Gaim every time you do something. Because in Age of Conan, which is a game they made oh, so many years ago, like 15 years ago, yeah, yeah, 15 kind of years ago, around. 15. Uh, the, f the first NPC you rescued, I forget her name, she had a, a really nice accent, like Swedish -ish accent and uh, a great rack. Uh, you could get her later on as a DLC, as a follower. She just followed you around and clapped and went woo every time you did something. I mean, fair enough. So hey, th there's hey, precedent. We all, yeah, we, we all need, uh, need support and validation. So, yeah. and hey. And that was Age of Conan. It was a brutal world where only the strong survive. It's fair enough. Or, you know, until the servers die. Yeah, I, I can't actually remember if, if it adapted the books or the movie. I'm not exactly sure which which they adapted because I, I, I'm not overly familiar with the books. I haven't really read them, mm. but I've seen the movies well, no and shit. the TV show. Oh my God, the TV show. Um, the yeah, this isn't this isn't the show for this isn't the, this isn't the episode for that. Uh, but uh, something I wanted to address is that you um, you kind of keyed in uh, on, uh, into a, um, on an important sort of uh, not necessarily uh, differentiation, but important component because you combined the world with uh, the system with the game system per se, and you have. You, you have the right approach there, uh, my friend, um, especially when we're talking about things uh, that come from the tabletop, with the exception when we're talking about systems that are designed to be used in sort of a like, you know, like customized, like build your own thing used in a universal or general um, sort of uh, setting. Systems and worlds should be designed generally to work as a, a, a as one it's never a great idea going back to your uh, spice wars example it's never a super great idea just to take one of the take one of the concepts and just stuff the other one into it 
somehow that's obviously it, it the dune spice wars um although i enjoy it it's obviously a grand strategy game with a dune skin on it more or less and and they could have done much more things with the dune original world regardless which adaptation they wanted to adapt but dune dune is a dune is an entire series of episodes which hopefully we'll get to at a certain point so we'll 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 skedaddle uh, uh, around dune for a bit you'll probably save it until you finish the last book at least the ones written by herbert uh oh that's gonna be a while you also mentioned something about like not being interested in fair which is super fair which is fair point like both of us have played D um i am i couldn't even say i'm a lapsed player because i haven't played in like more than 13 years i think uh the tabletop variety i mean but one of the things that i always had zero interest in was any of the already existing realms like as far as i was concerned D was a uh was a is a, a sandbox and i'm really not interested in what the other guy did i want to build my own weird shit. Um, i'll still use the same components although i customize those as well but that's something that has always sort of meant that i tended to uh, i tend to gravitate towards the more original sort of worlds and the reason f- the reason for my preference in general again is because that is th- that tends to be where you find the the more risky stuff the weirder stuff the the i'm gonna say the more interesting stuff mm. um such as tyranny because again i i love that i, I love that vi- i love that video and that wo- that game and that world maybe more than the average uh, rpg fan um so uh, that's why generally i tended to um sort of uh, go for those types of games however i can tell you that there can also be a sort of original world fatigue that can set in after a while like after many years of playing basically exclusively indie games in the rpgs crpgs i kind of felt the need to sort of go and do something and play something that was maybe uh, that that maybe had a bit of more uh, like history to it or um, stability in that sense more lore that i could get into and that i could possibly use sometime later on because it's always nice to explore a new world but when everything you do is explore new world after new world after new world uh, it, it it tends to become tiring it's tiring and and, and sometimes and even though like even if uh, the worlds are super interesting that you're exploring, or which, let's be honest, it's not always the case. Sometimes you do want comfort, comfort food, and in this case, it'll be you. You do kind of want the uh, the, the the comforting uh, experience of going back and revisiting a place uh, you've been in before. There is always this sort of. I feel it's kind of like a tension between uh, and it, it depends from person to person like I, I imagine there might be people out there who like only play original stuff or only play um, D&D stuff let's say or things that already exist but I think most RPG players out there kind of have this sort of internal tension whether or not they acknowledge it or not or whether or not it's a, is, a con- is a conscious tension about should I try this new thing that is fairly unknown and that's kind of interesting but it there's also the risk of it being shit or should i just stick with the stuff i know which even though i know it it's gonna it's gonna fit that sort of general need and uh, that that is something that i sometimes think about because i do want to try and check out different things but then again i do also want some comfort once in a while which is something I I recently sort of started introducing in my streams. Uh, recently, I streamed uh, not not only did I start streaming uh, Diablo, the OG. I'm not gonna call it Diablo One. It's just Diablo. That's that's what the title says. Uh, much like Fallout is Fallout. And I also played the Torchlight. And it, playing both of them felt real good. Not only because they are still real good games, like gameplay wise. 
but I also felt uh, felt real nice to to just go back to those worlds and to those settings that you've known and that sort of, that sort of stuff. Is it nostalgia? Partially, maybe, but it's also like comfort. You also need occasionally you need some comfort food, regardless how uh, how 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 much attention you're paying to what you eat. There's definitely some some amount of space that has to be made for both seeking out some new experiences and trying to discover new shit which you might like a lot and also keeping uh you know like seeing how the old shit has developed because in this sort of setup i'm i'm making right here it is assumed that the old stuff does develop it doesn't necessarily evolve but it does develop you're not literally playing the same game for 20 years you're playing slightly worse like diablo fair then it was diablo 2 and it would have been cool if other games showed up but you know it is what it is that that's something i sometimes think about and you know, that's why i want to discuss these things because these are random nerdy things that you can't really talk to about with everyone with anyone about i earlier sort of defined what an established world is and that is correct but I also feel it needs a slight addendum. So the established world has to already exist in a different medium, but I would also add with the addendum that this, mm, not necessarily the medium, like, but this, uh, uh, this incarnation should also be known in the mainstream or should also be fairly well known so that uh, at least in the respective community, it's a thing because there is at least a couple of games that are based or actually were based on pre-existing material on a pre-existing world but which literally those were super unknown in the wider community of gamers and the example that i give is the witcher which again was a book but it was a book in it was a polish book in polish I mean, it was a bit famous in like east of the Berlin Wall. It had some notoriety there, but outside yeah, of it, no. Like, like yeah, but US... I hadn't I hadn't heard of it uh, at the release of the game, and I was into fantasy shit back then. So I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm an authority, but I'm just saying if it didn't pierce my bubble, wasn't that well known. Which is fair, but even so, uh, even saying that, sure, definitely was not a thing on any on any sort of wider uh, community, even even for the game, even for RPG gamers. The other example being another favorite of mine, uh, Drakenzang, which again based on a tabletop game, but this was a German language tabletop game. Um, eventually, it, uh, like in I think in 2003, it got an English language version, but like trust me no one outside of very small parts of europe were uh, was aware uh, of drakenzang um and even now is not aware of the video games that much really uh just judging by my video on it um so there's also this sort of uh this sort of in between uh, this sort of in between um area between an established and an original where something you know can already pre-exist let's say but if it's not very well known it might as well be uh, a, a new sort of thing i mean also depends on uh, if we're going to draw that line between uh, it's it already exists but nobody knows it exists therefore it may be a new thing um, i think uh, an element that's important there is if it's so obscure that basically nobody cares what you do with it because if you take something like i don't know um, Super Mario, an yeah. obscure game like Super Mario, and uh, you fill it with um, electropunk monsters and uh, you know uh, analogies for Donald Trump, but he's a lizard. Um, I think maybe people would take issue with that if it was known. Let's say if you adapted that as a movie in 1992, <laughs> with Jean-Luc as Luigi and Bob Hoskins. Who played Hamlet? Now it's Mario. Well, so you know, Mario. Mario is the is the Hamlet of games. Yeah, that that adaptation of uh, Super Mario Bros. was probably more of an original world than uh, than the Rock and Song adaptation that we played. 
Yeah, it was. It was yeah, but again, like we're going, the, we're not talking about adaptations per se, although that is a good subject for a for a different for a future episode. We, we're still keeping it to the uh, to the realm of the RPGs and RPG worlds in general. Unfortunately, like we can discuss in wax philosophical and artsy fartsy about you know what are the pros and cons of original versus established uh, for a long time, and trust us, we can. Unfortunately, there is this much more, um, let's say, decision making year layer uh, that goes on top of that, which is, you know, the people with money and the people who fund these things, basically. When I'm talking about the choice of whether a developer goes to do, tries to do something that's in an established world or in an original world, it also depends a lot on funding, basically. Also on a very important world word in the corporate world called synergy. Oh my god, yes, fair enough. Or vertical integration sometimes, if you will. Because um, basically, uh, going back to Faerun as an example, the reason why everybody uses Faerun is because Faerun is the base upon which you build your module. You publish a module, you, you write something, you write an adventure, it's just your adventure, but it's it's stuffed in the thing that's already selling. So instead of starting from here, like from the bottom, where you have basically no chance, no visibility, nothing to the, that adventure to, you know, get eyes on it, you start from up here where it's already in a system. It's already in a world. It's already in a product that's selling. So you have a chance to sell it. That's how we got modules. That's how we got basically every adaptation of Dungeons and Dragons because it was based on something that sold. So the people with money said, hey, what if we uh, we use that thing that sold to make more things that will sell based on the fact that that previous thing also sold? It's brand awareness. Yeah, um, it's brand awareness. It's uh, familiarity is also like built in marketing, more or less. Um, and that is Space what... Space the video game. Fair enough. That is also why there, there, there's not just this sort of perceived, but it's kind of real, but not necessarily, but it is. That's why it's so difficult to get funding for, you know, original worlds, because those are very risky. Those are that that is an extremely risky uh, proposition to um, any sort of person with money who wants, you know, more money on top of that money, basically. With those things, it's it's a difficult. Uh, the more original, the more different your world is compared to something existing, the harder it is to give an elevator pitch, like a mm. twenty second, fifteen second pitch. If you just say, "Oh, it's Grand Theft Auto, but it's in Shanghai," or it's, I don't know, Grand Theft Auto, but it's in Los Angeles, Grand Theft Auto, but you throw tigers at people, sold. That's how we got the GTA clone. That's why everybody did it. That's how we got True Crime. That's how we got Sleeping Dogs. That's how we got Saints Row. That's how we got all those games. Because somebody elevator pitched Grand Theft Auto, but with that. Somebody's going to pitch, I don't know, uh, Star Wars. But we get to keep all the money. And Mass Effect was born. That is, yeah, that's not a... Hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, that, that is a weird sort of... Uh, uh, I would call it somewhat of an outlier success in 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 that sense but just but not really because it did have a lot of budget behind it yeah it, it also it also like the first the first mass effect game i i don't I'm not sure if i made a show about it so i were talked about it too much on the english channel but the first mass effect game was a complete ripoff of an acronox down to the party members the plot the action beats and oh yeah the, the end boss fight of the second game that was verbatim like beat by beat beat the exact same boss fight the exact same last mission from an acronox like exactly the same with the same characters you had the ex you split the, par the the group into three parts you have one party led by you one party led by the girl who's the sub leader and only her because nobody else would be capable of leading that team and you had the third one which was just the tiny robot or the, the big robot going into like ducks and hacking it was the same goddamn thing and they got away with it well they they did because no one really knows about the anachronox really yeah i know it's it's it, 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 
it bugs me to this day. Also, they, they well, so the boss was from Contra Four or something, and the, what well, you basically fought an enemy. Hey, look, like, end, like, so. like uh, uh, at, at a certain point, we also one one has to acknowledge that even when we say, even when I use the word original, everything that is being made is gonna be influenced. A rip off of a rip off of a rip off of a rip off. Well, I prefer the word remix, but that's just me. Because I, I come from an art background. Everything that is that is gonna be made is gonna be influenced and informed, and there's gonna be all of these other different bits and bobs that go into it that you know uh, people take from uh, somewhere else. Sometimes you do it subconsciously. Like in my book, Tale of Doom, available now on Amazon. I actually, just buy it from Itch.io. I don't think I even have a bank account tied to Amazon anymore. Um, there was a scene that was verbatim copied from Shrek 2. When I really realized that about a year after the book was out, I deleted it. Yeah, when I was just like proof, proofreading the fifth versions to make sure I don't have any more, there's still a few spelling mistakes in it. Uh, I just it just dawned on me. Oh my god, I know where that scene's from, and I just stole it. I, I didn't mean it. I didn't want to do it, but it happened. Although if it, like Shrek in itself, though, though it, that that in itself is it is just like an amalgamation parody slash it's yeah, one of all fairy tales. But the scene itself was just was just dialogue with people sitting at a table ye- yelling their names, and then the donkey goes donkey. Well, I did you, that. Uh, okay, that is that is a bit. Well, you just thought it's funny, and it is the just the setup, the, the the various steps, the algorithm of that particular mm, scene just uh, infiltrated, incepted yeah. into your brain. Oh, but um, like talking about D and D adaptations in video games and how the system can be used on its own. Possibly one of the better examples of this has been a game called Solasta, which was released a couple of years ago, I want to say by now. It's uh, been, it, it, it got a bunch of expansions and stuff like that in the meanwhile. I covered the original one and Solasta is on uh, fifth edition, but they just did their really, they like, they tweaked some things here and there. And you know, it's not the entirety of fifth edition because it's only like the whatever common use chunk they could use legally, but they did their own, they, they did their own world which you know granted fairly generic fantasy world but even in these situations you can always find uh, you can sometimes not always sometimes you can find some great sort of rpg concepts or mechanical concepts that should be taken over or should be stolen by other devs and the example i have from solasta is that one of the so you can you can build reputation with various factions but one of the factions is called the scavengers if i remember correctly and what the role of the fun uh, of this faction is once you clear a dungeon you can go to the faction you can tell them yo this dungeon is cleared go and grab all the loot and they will just grab all the loot you left you can still of course you can still loot the bodies so you'll generally take all the potions and all the super magical shit, but you can then tell them, go uh, check out, go clean up the this dungeon I just cleared. So no monsters, you're fine. And after a bit, not 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 only will they go and pick up all the items and give you a serious amount of money based on it. Obviously, they're gonna take commission because they're doing this massive service for you. But before they do that, they also show you the list of all the items they took. So in case you forgot to grab like a magic item or something, cause it can happen, you can just take it from them and no harm, no foul. So that is the type of sort of uh, mechanic that should be stolen and should be implemented in other things. Uh, cause so I got reminded of this by playing Torchlight where you have the pet whom you can send to town to sell the, their inventory. Which Dungeons again had the same thing with a with a goblin or something. Which again, it's such a great concept because it takes the it takes the loot run out. It takes the town run uh, issue, uh, you know, concept out of it. You know, depending if the game drops potions and other consumables that you might need. Like sometimes, depending on the world and on the system, you may have to go to town more often than not. But in the case of Solasta, they also had this mechanic of like, uh, it, it took time and rations and you could have random encounters on the way to dungeons. So it was, it was, they did their best to sort of adapt the sort of tabletop experience into the video game realm. But then they thought, hmm, how could we improve this without everyone being over encumbered or buying 50 donkeys 
and people and helpers and then having those fuckers get slaughtered in some random pit trap you know it happens shit happens in dnd uh, or you know because then you have to you have to uh, calculate you, you're gonna need wages for everyone they're gonna need food it's complicated then then it turns into a like a general management game which again not necessarily a bad thing but it depends on also the type of experience you're looking for at any, in any particular um, RPG uh, sort of uh, thing. Which, by the way, now that I say that, Neverwinter Nights introduced fortress management, sort of. I'm pretty sure it existed before that, but oh, that's yeah, the... Baldur's Gate 2 had it as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, but I didn't... Uh, I, Baldur's Gate didn't click with me, so I didn't get to that point. Neverwinter Nights did, again doesn't whatever reason so but that's the, the those are the titles that's the title that i sort of associate with introducing some uh management some general sort of resource management in that sense features into an rpg which then also happened in pillars of eternity but that's a, yeah. and partially in tyranny different there different they they st- they streamline that shit in, th- in tyranny considerably much more pillars was another uh, um case of Let's make Dungeons and Dragons, but keep all the money. Also, not give anything to Wizards of the Coast. But um, that was also an adaptation that had some really uh, big differences compared to the um, the original setting that were important. Like there are no like real healing spells in Pillars of Eternity. I don't think I would call it an adaptation because it's not. I mean, it's not based on any on any license system. As yeah. far as I know, yeah, sure. It's it's an it's an original work. Yeah, but if it were if they were simply adapting uh, Faerun, uh, you know, standard Dungeons and Dragons, there would be healing magic. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. But th- th- that that just doesn't fit in that world in that tone. Mm-hmm. It needed to be different. It needed to be something else. Uh, other situations where people have to do something like that like they have to come not, don't necessarily want to make an original world but they can't because either the original uh, doesn't fit in like in the case of pillars of eternity or they can't get they can't like get their hands on it ultima like arcane wanted to make ultima underworld 3 they couldn't they weren't allowed to so they made arx fatalis Bl- blizzard was making warhammer and then uh, were, you know the the good people at uh, Games Workshop said no, and uh, bam, multi-billion dollar franchise that eclipsed Warhammer. Twice. That's, uh, he's talking about StarCraft, by the way. Um, and Warcraft. Even, even if you think it's Warcraft, it's actually StarCraft, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um well like World fair of enough warcraft made so much money yeah fair enough like um uh, warcraft uh, orcs versus humans there is there is some amount of you could argue there is a little bit of like warhammer inspiration there no no it, it was initially a, a, a war uh a warhammer game what well, starcraft was initially warhammer 40k no it was just a, it was just a mod for start with a mod for for start for yeah. warcraft 2 initially yeah no initially it was made to look basically it was made in the same engine as warcraft 2 but from my research uh, starcraft was initially 40k because that's why we have space marines that's why the zergs are tyranids and that's why the protos are basically eldar i thought they were just continuing to rip off because it works well the first time no no, no. from what i from what i gather uh, they had a license to do warhammer 40k and whether or not the li- it's it i couldn't find anything about what exactly actually happened whether or not the license uh, expired or someone from games workshop they just pulled it out or they didn't um they didn't agree or some shit. but that 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 is what i uh, found looking into it like a bunch of years ago um and so as far as i'm concerned it makes a lot of sense uh, space marines space marines and there, there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities between StarCraft and Warcraft 40k. Again, uh, they're not accidental. Like Blizzard's whole shtick was, hey, that's good. Let's do it and not give them money. <laughs> that, that's that's been their whole shtick for, for as long as they existed. Let's try to circle back and reach uh, a sort of um, not necessarily a conclusion because we're not discussing a problem. 
uh, of any sort we're just uh, we're just talking a sort of consensus regarding when when established world and when original both from like your preference as a gamer and let's also assume your preference as a developer let's let's put ourselves in like the developer shoes with the caveat of we're indies we do not have larian budget no just budget. so well to, to to be fair larian not long ago didn't have larian budget they yeah but they, that they, they, not they, long ago they, they, they committed tax fraud to get a game done yeah but point. not yeah, yeah yeah but that not long ago was like 10 years ago things have things have changed uh, drastically since then uh but yeah so not larian budget now or even after divinity original sin you, you do have some amount of budget like it's not it's not bootstrap shit you do you, you can develop for a while so as a gamer what do you prefer or or when would you prefer an established game an established world versus um versus an original one well again it depends on what is being uh used if it's i'm going to give you an example uh there is an anime out now that's really hot it's based on a, uh, a series of manga because they, they all are it's called dungeon meshi or delicious in dungeon or just dungeon food depending on what version you're watching um it's it's basically just a bunch of people going into a dungeon and making food. That's that's sort of like me telling you that Mad Max is a bunch of people racing cars in a desert. In the desert? Yeah. Okay. But there's I mean you're not so, you're not wrong. You're not wrong on that one. The core that's the con the core concept, but on top of that it builds like it slowly drip feeds a world that is incredibly interesting and incredibly complex and incredibly engaging. And I would love to explore that in a video game. I would love to explore that in a video game made by Arcane. They don't have to call it Arx 2, they can call it Delicious in Dungeon the Game. And it would be amazing because, I mean, Arx already had cooking in it. You could make bread. I mean, what, what's baking bread compared to, I don't know, making a uh, f f uh, chop suey or lamb chop out of the bits of the chimera that's a lamb? I don't know. It, that's what the, the, the series is about it's making food out of monsters that would be awesome to play for me as a gamer as a developer if i'm a fan of that thing hell yeah i'm, I'm doing it hell yeah i want to actually there, there's one thing i would love to do as both actually and that's adapt this ah uh, well dungeon crawl classics I think uh, I think that one. I think in that case, uh, it's much closer to uh, you can make something that's kind of like that, but don't call it that because I don't know how much the license would cost. Yeah, um, and the thing that attracts me to this is the the world. Not actually, not even the world. It's it's again. And this this is more has to do with with the with the blurring of the background. More has to do with with the rule system again just like dungeons and dragons but it's one of uh, there's a bleakness to the rule system that makes it unique that you have to adapt the world as well because there is corruption in this that happens when your character miscasts a spell and that happens because this world is so deranged that somebody walking around with a tentacle instead of a foot happens and not necessarily everybody thinks it's weird and you can't have that in in every setting because people would think it's weird and try to chop it off and do other things but in this one it works another thing that i would love to see adapted more in video games again as both a developer and as a, uh, a gamer is ignore the flying debris this terry pratchett's this world i've got a bunch of books back there i just picked uh, up reaper man there's been like only three games where you get to explore this world and they were all adventure games they were all linear you didn't have necessarily maybe the freedom that you'd want to associated with this giant all-encompassing world but it was the right medium i mean um adapting or using uh, the disc world uh, world the disc for something other than an adventure game would not be in the spirit of the books uh, you can't really have an action game in, in this setting. You can't really have a strategy game in this setting. You could, however, have um, a city management game. 
where you play as veterinarian, try to well, maybe you play as veterinary's cousin who takes over the job because veterinary is on vacation or was kidnapped again, and uh, you have to try and balance the various guilds and the various havoc-causing events that happen in the disc uh, and in Ankh work constantly. That would be an amazing thing to adapt, and that works only because of the setting, only because of those characters, only because of how that world functions. Whereas, uh, you know, something like Dungeon Crawl Classics, in, in a way, in, in some aspect, would work without the setting. I mean, I, I, we just played a level zero campaign that was set in the 80s and modern times and didn't feature basically anything that's from the actual world, apart from a few artifacts that, like, fell into this reality. And it, it was still a great, a great time. But uh, there's also the the flip side of the coin one I have to pay the people money that I'm adapting this thing from so that's that's one issue that many will take uh, objection to and the other one is um, maybe they would maybe they don't want to in which case I'm gonna have to make something of my own which uh, it's something I'm trying to do in book form for Ultima mm -hmm. which uh, with a well, I'm not sure if it's gonna be a series or just one book something called the uh, I don't think they have a no, they, they, they don't have a, a, like an exclusive license of the word avatar, so I think I'm okay. I hope not. Hopefully. 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 I mean, I'm not going to be using the term Lord British or Lady British because, fun fact, um, Electronic Arts owns Lady British because they couldn't get Lord British because that's his moniker. It's been his moniker since way before Electronic Arts and Ultima. Uh, but hey, that, that, that's actually one a very funny aspect uh, Lord British Richard Garrett made an Ultima another Ultima MMO but he couldn't use Ultima but he could use Lord British in it he just he made Shrouded the Avatar which is it's, it's, the, it's, it's Ultima the interesting thing there is that he is Lord British Lord British is real basically is what I'm saying and uh, looking at it in a super meta sort of way you know this is just one of the worlds Lord British happens to uh, have ma uh, materialized in. There's nothing There's nothing that says the other ones don't exist or don't happen. When also, as coming from the side of a developer, um, sometimes you just want to make your own stuff. Like, yeah, Ultima's great. I'd love to, to work on an Ultima game. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic that maybe somebody someday is going to make a video game version of the Reaper Man or a Dungeon Crawl Classics, but sometimes you just want to make your own stuff because it's yours. You want to own it. You want to have complete creative control over it, and you can't do that with any any established world. None of them. You always have strings attached. You always have... I mean, if, if it's not... Uh, if it's not going to be an executive breathing down your neck saying, hey, 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 you do not get to make this character say this word or have them smoke. No, no. If it's not that, it's gonna be the fans, and they're gonna kill you. They're gonna. Like, yeah, I New was. New World Computing. New World Computing couldn't even add sci-fi elements to Heroes of Might and Magic, which is an established. Might and Magic was established as having sci-fi and fantasy elements. They couldn't do it because they got death threats. Yeah. Like, you, you can't before even. Before the internet. The, before the own. internet. Yeah. Uh, before the internet was a thing. Yeah. Uh, that if, is something. If you, if if an original work goes along, goes on long enough, it becomes an established work, and you can't you don't have control over it anymore. Like everybody else is gonna have their own vision of it, and you just because you're the creator, your opinion doesn't mean crap. So you may as well start a new one. And that is a discussion for a completely different episode. I'd like to thank uh, Unicam for joining me uh, for this uh, pilot experiment podcast. We'll see if we get, uh, if and when we get to do some more. This is going to depend, uh, you know, largely on our schedules, but um, it's also important to hear uh, from those of you who have watched most of this, hopefully, maybe even all of it. Um, let us know in the comments what you generally think about um, these sorts of, you know, more, I hope, nuanced or in-depth discussions about uh, gaming that don't necessarily have to 
focus around either news, uh, controversy, uh, you know, flame wars and that sort of stuff where we can just uh, more or less wax poetic about, you know, the, the, the deeper meaning, let's say, uh, the, or the potential deeper meaning that some of us can find within uh, games, within our games or others. Um, I don't know exactly when this is going to go up, to be honest. But uh, the idea is um, uh, I will post uh, somewhere either in, the, either in the description or in a, in a comment um, any link that uh, Unicom finds relevant. Um, otherwise, I think you can find them occasionally on, on Twitter, myself as well. But, you know, the best way to uh, get in touch with us is to literally leave a comment. Tell us what you thought about uh, this uh, show. It's not a show yet about this uh, about this episode, and uh, we'll see what we do uh, going forward. I've been Stephen Nonsense. I've been Unicom, and uh, thank you very much for watching, and have a great rest of your day.